Well, that's the fastest I've ever seen. Here we go. Start to fill up. We're up to 160 people already. Wow. I'll just say welcome to everybody that's that's logging in. We'll start in a few minutes. And uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Oh boy, we're up to 2.30. That's great. Hello, Roland. We got a chat message from Roland there. That's great. And people are still flooding in. We've got about four minutes till we'll start, everybody. So just uh, hang in there, and uh, we're going to start about uh, a minute or two after seven. We'll get everyone a chance as much as possible to get in so they don't miss anything. And we'll get started then. Oh, we're above 300 people now. Wow. Yes, uh, video and audio are automatically off for all participants. Only the panel will be able to speak and, and be seen. And that's a feature of Zoom webinar. Someone just asking me that. And uh, yeah, we will we'll save as many questions as possible till the end. We will uh, do the, the presentation first. And uh, we'll use the chat and the question and answer function, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can towards the end of the session tonight. A lot of folks in chat. Save our trees. We will, Eric. We'll try. <laughs> Video and audio is off for guests, yes. And someone asked, what benefit to our planet is the gypsy moth? Well, <laughs> we'll see if we can answer that at the end. And some thanks for this presentation. No, Art, you don't get to talk. Sorry. A lot of friends out there that are uh, making comments here. That's great. We're getting up to close to 400 people. So we'll just give it another two minutes or so and we'll get started. Getting a lot of thanks to people from people for doing this. It's great. Just we're about a minute from starting. Um, I'll show folks out there. Again, there's the Q&A function. Should be at the bottom of your screen. You can type questions in there and we'll again answer them towards the end. Or you can use the chat function. And uh, we'll again try to answer as many questions as we can towards the end. And yes, this presentation is being recorded and will be available to, to folks after that. We'll get the links out within a day or two. And there, there is going to be a survey as well. Jim will talk to that in a few minutes. Okay. I think we'll get started then. So we've got people joining in, but it's quite a big crowd already, so that's great. So, good evening everyone. I'm John Pino. I'm the Executive Director of the Ontario Woodlot Association and also the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. And the two organizations are in the, the process of merging and bringing all kinds of great value together for a, a future super organization, I guess you could say. 
The Ontario Woodlot Association is proud to be a part of this and, and host this technically, but it is a, a session that's been organized by Jim McCready and, and he's the chair of the Forest Health Network. So Jim, very pleased to turn it over to you for a few minutes to introduce things. Thank you very much. What we have here tonight is we have a thousand people that have registered and then we have 200 others that have uh, wanted the recording afterwards. Uh, the Regional Forest Health Network, it was put together in 2008 to deal with forest health in Eastern Ontario, Western Quebec and Northern New York State. And it's made up of a number, a number of government agencies, conservation authorities, organizations, Aquasosny, and uh, uh, 27 in total. It was the Forest Health Network that said this year we had to deal with the gypsy moth. We have other things at our doorstep over in, in New York State, like the uh, oak wilt and uh, spotted lanternfly and Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, our forests are under stress. And this year uh, we uh, looked at gypsy moth and it is really putting our forest under stress. What we decided to do was come up with three parts. First part was put out a four page report, which uh, we did earlier in <laughs> 2021. Uh, the next step was to do a gypsy moth status report uh, partway through uh, the beginning of the uh, gypsy moth infestation. And that's what this is now. And later in the year, we're gonna to put together where, what happened in 2021 and where do we go from here? Important was who can we get to put it together? And we uh, took one of our members, Eric Boysen. Eric Boysen uh, is a landowner in Maberly, 200 acres. His past, uh, he was a director with the Ministry of Natural Resources and one of his portfolio under that was the invasive species. So he was the ideal candidate to go to, to actually put this together for us. And uh, we like uh, Eric and have to thank him for doing so. Also this year, uh, Burgess Wood, which is on Audie Lake, did a spray program. And matter of fact, they just finished the spraying this morning. So we have Sue uh, Freeman, Susan Freeman, who was a counselor at Tay Valley, who got, this all put together. And <clears throat> also you got uh, Greg Greenwood, who is a retired uh, wildlife biologist, Ministry of Natural Resources that worked with Zimmer Air Service uh, to carry on the spraying. What we have to take a look at is who is bringing this to us, this, uh, the program to you. And it's the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. And it's under an agreement that we had signed with the Invasive Species Center called the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network. And this is funded by the Trillium Foundation. And uh, the Trillium Foundation has uh, asked us to put a questionnaire together to send out to everyone. So I am telling you, uh, you're gonna get a questionnaire please fill that out and send it back in because it's they are the ones that are helping us bring this together, the Eastern Ontario uh, Model Forest and uh, the Ontario Woodlot Association. So what I'm gonna tell you is webinar approach uh, because of the numbers, we will have uh, live audio from the audience. Uh, you use the chat line uh, hands up feature to ask questions. We will do that uh, through the program and your own observations experience. The moderator will be tracking and uh, John, uh, he'll summarize as best as possible. And the webinar will be recorded and can be viewed on both the uh, Eastern Ontario Model Force and the Ontario Woodlot Association website. And uh, we, decided we have an hour and a half, but we are going to stay on as long as it takes that we can answer questions. Like I said, we have a thousand people registered and there are probably going to be a lot of questions and hopefully our discussions that we have tonight will answer all these questions. 
what we got to remember is we're all in this together. We're here for the long haul. And the long haul is until the virus and the fungus knock, knock this uh, insect back. So saying that, what I want to do tonight is uh, turn it over to Eric Boysen, who is going to start off and tell us uh, uh, all about what is happening on his property down in Maberly. And he's been looking after this for two years. So Eric, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, everybody, I'm going to turn my video off. Many of you know me, you don't need to see me. Just I live rarely and my internet is not that great. So by turning the video off, hopefully I won't get interrupted. So I'll see you at the end. I'll turn my face back on then. So uh, just a quick overview of what we want to do. Um, Jim mentioned we already did a fact sheet early in, earlier in the springtime just to kind of get people thinking about what might be happening in 2021. But I'll go back just a little bit. Uh, we did um, another overview of Gypsy Moth at the Kempville Woodlock Conference in February. So if any of you attended that virtual Woodlock Conference, I presented there. So you might see some of the same slides because I think it's important to remind people of where we came from in 2020. Um, talk about the gypsy moth history, its life cycle, etc. Because although we've been dealing with it for a couple of years, many people are new to this insect and it's important to understand the life cycle and therefore how your interventions might be able to uh, make a difference. We'll talk about 2021. We made a prediction before the season and uh, we'll just recap to see um, how that season is going so far. We're going to talk about all aspects, um, the, the biology of the bug itself. There were a lot of human health impacts that were noted this year for the first time. And then of course, everybody implemented various control measures and we'll talk about each one of those and what's worked and what hasn't. Uh, we'll then move on to what's next. Um, as Jim mentioned, we're, we're still in the middle of the gypsy moth feeding cycle. So there's still some opportunity to do some intervention, but at times coming to an end. And uh, more importantly for me is the long-term aspect of this. Um, and we'll talk about the impact of gypsy moth on trees, on the forest, and both the short and long term. So with that, um, I'll get going. Uh, so quickly on the, oh, uh, John, did you want to do uh, uh, your web poll on participants and where they came from? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Eric. That's a good idea. Just the, uh, the poll will be launched here. And and folks can just indicate where they're uh, they're coming from tonight, or where they're where they're where they're located tonight. And uh, I'm going to launch it right now. So if you could just fill in where you're you're located, that'll help us to understand our demographics. Oh, lots of people picking a spot there. <laughs> We're over 520 people now. Looks like a majority from Eastern Ontario. I'm going to give it another 30 seconds or so. If you could just uh, indicate where you're from. Okay. I think that's pretty much it. I'll just show the results here so everyone can have a look. Can everyone see that? So majority from Eastern Ontario, some from Central, GTA and Golden Horseshoe, some from Southwestern Ontario and from other parts of the province. There we go. Okay, that, that helps me because I've been getting questions about what's happening to my trees. And uh, as I mentioned, gypsy moth is happening right across um, Southern Ontario right now and, and extending into Northern Ontario. So where you are makes a bit of a difference. So just a quick history of gypsy moth in North America. The Latin name is Lamantria dispar dispar. Um, you may have heard some discussion in the press recently. Um, some people are, are hoping to change the name gypsy moth to the LDD moth. Uh, they see the word gypsy as being um, a bit of a slur. 
So in keeping with the times, uh, trying to change the name and they've uh, suggested LDD moth after the Latin name. I'm not sure if that's the best name to go to. I understand the motivation behind it, but maybe there's another thing we can call this pest. Uh, the French common name is spongeuse. Um, uh, it's native to Europe and Asia, and it got here in a very well-documented kind of way. There was a professor named Etienne Trouvelot who uh, introduced the gypsy moth from France in order to cross it with a silkworm in hopes of uh, developing a North American silk industry. Uh, it, it was a bad idea, number one, because those aren't even compatible species. They could not be interbred. And uh, so, of course, it didn't work. But then uh, inevitably, these bugs, as you've seen, uh, are highly mobile and they escaped from his Massachusetts location in 1869. So we know exactly how it got here and at what point it started its rampage across the uh, eastern North American forest. It's uh, now considered to be as one of the most significant defoliators of hardwood trees and it feeds on over 300 species of trees, shrubs and plants. So that brings it right into your uh, front yard, your backyard, and your woodlot. Because it is such a, a destructive pest, it's a regulated pest by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in Canada and by their equivalent in the United States, which means that there's limitations on moving this pest back and forth, uh, uh, limitations on transporting uh, products that may have been infested with gypsy moth egg masses and everything. This bug, and this is where it got its original name from, gypsy moth, is highly mobile and it can lay its eggs hidden underneath uh, vehicles, uh, uh, wheel wells of RVs and, and, uh, and the transport trucks and, and they can hitch long distances to expand their range. And, and um, they're also very uh, mobile locally and we'll get into that in a minute as well. So there's two types of uh, gypsy moths now, the European one that we're dealing with here in Eastern North America and the Asian gypsy moth, which is on uh, the West Coast. The difference is, is that the uh, female Asian moths can fly, whereas the European can't. So that's a bit to our advantage on this side of the uh, continent. Okay, well, there we go. So just a quick look at the uh, regulated zone. So. Um, you can see Ontario, you can see Quebec, you can see New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. Um, so in Canada, if, if there's any consolation in this map is that we're not alone when we're dealing with uh, gypsy moth. And then when you look uh, into the United States, it's all the way uh, surrounding the Great Lakes Basin down into West Virginia, Virginia. Hasn't quite found its way into Kentucky, Tennessee yet. Um, but the tree species that they have down there are equally as susceptible as uh, our tree species around here. Bringing it back a little bit more locally, uh, there's this program that we have been advocating through the Invasive Species Center called EDMAPS, which is Early Detection and um, uh, Mapping System. It's a, a computer-based or a phone-based application where if you see something, you can take a picture of it, you can report it, uh, you can also do that on a toll-free number. But uh, the uh, nice thing about this application is that there are experts at the other end of your submission that will positively identify what you had or what you thought you had. And then it becomes a, um, an occurrence record. Uh, so we can see how it's distributed right across, uh, not only in Ontario, but across North America. So just here's a snapshot you can see the numbers there just represent the numbers of reports that are coming from that locale over the last year, with a lot coming from the GTA and, and southwestern uh, Ontario. And that makes sense because the gypsy moth has made a stand there longer than it has in eastern Ontario. Uh, but when you look uh, North Bay, Mattawa, Espanola, Sault Ste. Marie, it's, it's up in northern Ontario as well. So um, we're not alone. Just a little bit of history uh, of the moth in Ontario. Uh, and although it was escaped in 1860s in, in Massachusetts, it was not detected in Ontario until it was found on Wolf Island near Kingston in 1969. Um, from 1969, it kind of sled, uh, spread slowly, but then the first outbreak uh, where it actually, the population expanded to the same kind of scale that we're seeing right now, it commenced in 1981 around Caledar. And anybody who's familiar with Caledar, it's the 
oak, pine, uh, highlands, shallow rocky soils, lots of oak. And that's one of the key things that the gypsy moth seems to be keying in on as, it's, as it expands its range or as its population expands is that it loves oak. So if you have a, an abundance of oak in your neighborhood, you're likely to have an abundance of gypsy moth as well. Uh, MNR at the time was concerned about gypsy moth because we didn't have any experience with it at the time and, and it was, um, had it indicated in the states that it could kill uh, hardwood trees um, within two or three years of defoliation. Um, there's a lot of oak through central Ontario and uh, they were concerned. At the same time, there was no indication at the time that there was any natural control factors for uh, gypsy moth, so a, a spray program was implemented. But by 1996, the larvae had been noted uh, in North Bay and Sault Ste. Marie. And since that time, and you can see the graph down below, it kind of peaks. There's no regular cycle for gypsy moth because it's more um, responding to environmental conditions and um, availability of food. Um, but of, of note here is the 2020 spike. So, 1985, 91, 2002, uh, folks in and around the GTA and Niagara region were suffering uh, through gypsy moth. But then uh, this all com accumulated into a moderate to severe defoliation across Southern Ontario in 2020. So people, I th here's a quick look at the, uh, the life cycle. We'll start up in the uh, top right corner. I think this is where most people would recognize gypsy moth and um, uh, this is kind of following on the green circle um, in the, uh, the life cycle diagram there. But gypsy moth egg masses can be laid anywhere. Um, they're small buff colored um, uh, egg masses. Uh, each female will lay one egg mass. Um, some of the egg masses can be small, some can be large. I think a small egg mass indicates a declining or stressed population, whereas large egg masses implies that it was a good year for the females. They, they came into the um, egg laying stage well fed and, and, and um, were able to produce a lot of eggs. You can see that uh, the gypsy moth at the base of this tree um, lay a lot of their egg masses below what is going to be the snow level and it provides an insulating uh, layer for them. Um, but I, I know for a fact um, that the eggs can be found right from the base of the tree, right up to the tips of a 24 meter tall tree, because I had to cut some of my 24 meter tall trees down this year and found egg masses all the way to the top. So there's the egg mass stage and it, it's probably the easiest and best time to intervene at a local level with gypsy moth because you can scrape these egg masses off and we'll go over that in a bit more detail later. Uh, by May, uh, the gypsy moth start to hatch and you can see a picture, uh, the middle picture on the right hand side. There is an egg mass with the uh, larvae that have just hatched. Um, so they're very small at this stage, maybe two to three millimeters. Uh, they hang around their egg mass site for three or five days waiting for ideal conditions to um, disperse. And um, this is also not a bad time to intervene if you can get at them. Um, you know this egg mass is, uh, has hatched and the gypsy moth are there and you can squish a whole bunch of them in a big hurry. Beyond that, uh, we're going down now into the bottom right corner. As they start to feed in May and through June, uh, the gypsy moth will go through five or six larval stages. They're called instars. So on this diagram surrounding a dime, you can see the very smallest one on the bottom. That's the first instar. At each stage, they molt and shed their exoskeleton and uh, then they can expand and grow to the bigger size. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth instar, sixth instar in this picture. Interestingly, the males only go through five instars and they start flying, pupating and flying around well before the females may have even finished eating. Uh, but then the females um, need that extra instar to gain, to gain the nutrition that they need uh, to produce the eggs and lay the eggs. So going around now to the bottom left corner there, the, uh, are the adult um, 
uh, larvae um, that uh, lady or in stars, uh, they congregate. They've got the very characteristics, blue and, and uh, red dots up and down their, their body. And so you'll see that now, uh, the, they're, they're starting to descend from the crowns now. They're starting to make themselves uh, known to you again. Um, and uh, you can intervene at this stage as well by squishing or scraping or doing whatever you wanna do. Finally, by end of June, early July, they begin to pupate and there's a, a picture of uh, pupa. And um, there, you, there you can tell the difference between a male and female at this stage just by the size. But um, I, I just accumulated these ones for my property last year. You wouldn't normally find them like this. Um, they're more dispersed, but um, we'll talk about that as well. And finally, in July, uh, they emerge, uh, as I mentioned, the males come out first and they can fly and you'll see them flying everywhere. Uh, they seemingly have no pattern. They're just frenzied moths looking for females. The females, when they finally emerge, uh, they send out pheromones, um, which are scent markers that attract the males. The females cannot fly, as I mentioned earlier. And so the males are attracted to them, they mate, and then the female uh, can lay their eggs. Um, the males can mate with more than one female and there's records of a female being mated by more than one male. So it doesn't take more than one female and one male to lay an egg mass of 300 and you can see how the population can start to build. So the, in 2020, I, I, I would say that the gypsy moth defoliation expanded into Eastern Ontario. And I think it took many by surprise. Uh, people had not been noticing egg masses. Um, if they had, they didn't think it was going to amount to much. But it, if you've been paying attention in the woods, you would have seen that the population had been building well before then. Um, I, I started seeing egg masses in 2017, a few more in 18. I saw some larvae in 2019, and then bang, there was 2020 with uh, the population outbreak. And of course, Southwestern and, so and Central Ontario people have been suffering at a moderate to severe defoliation level since 2018. So the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry run a forest health monitoring program and they do surveys for a whole variety of insect pests across the province. And uh, we were fortunate last year because it was a COVID year, they weren't um, really allowed out in the field until the COVID protocols had been established, but they were able to get up and do their aerial survey um, in, early July and they mapped uh, 570,000 hectares of defoliation in 2020. So that looked something like this. Um, here's the map of the uh, defoliation in 2019 and you can see the total amount of moderate severe defoliation in the province was just over 40,000 hectares. And I made a little blue circle over here because that's kind of my neck of the woods and I, I Charlotte Lake was ground zero in Eastern Ontario. How it got from here to Charlotte Lake, well, who knows, but there's two provincial parks in Charlotte Lake and people like camping them. Maybe, maybe that's how it happened, who knows. Um, here's the 2020 map. So you can see how all those little red specks in 2019 coalesced into a big red blob. Uh, the moderate to severe defoliation was now up to 570,000 hectares. And of note, uh, look up in, in, in the Sudbury region, you can see a, a big outbreak up around Wanapate Lake. So um, there's 2020 and, uh, you know, brought it into people's, you know, uh, consciousness here that gypsy moth can be a problem and we better get ready. So as, as early as last year, there was starting to be a lot of public response to gypsy moth. Uh, townships and counties were putting out fact sheets on what you could do and, and helping people understand uh, the history of the gypsy moth as well. Um, but people were still very concerned and um, wanted to know more. What could we do? So again, thanks to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry Forest Health uh, Monitoring Team, uh, they went out afterwards. And um, you can't always look at what happened last year as an indicator of what might happen next year. The only way to really do it is to look at um, the eggs that have been laid and the abundance of leg, eggs, uh, how many per hectare, that kind of thing. 
to use that as a predictor of how bad it could be in the following year. I mean, there's a lot of things that could happen between the time the eggs are laid in, in July and by the time they hatch the next May. Um, but, you know, if every egg mass survives and every egg hatches and every egg becomes a mature caterpillar, well, the amount of defoliation can be predicted. And um, MNR predicted that most of the area where they found gypsy moth in 2020 uh, would experience uh, severe defoliation again in 2021. And from what I've seen so far, I think they're right. So what makes gypsy moth defoliation so bad? So I, I mentioned it earlier. It's, it's just a matter of math to me. Uh, the size and the impact of the population can get very big, very quickly. So each egg mass, as I mentioned, may contain 100 to 300 eggs. I've read some reports of 500 eggs, but I've never seen that many. I'd hate to see that many. Uh, I don't know how they calculated this, but each larva can consume one square meter of foliage uh, by itself from the time it's hatched to the time it pupates. So 100 to 300 times one square meter of foliage times however many egg masses you had on your tree times however many acres you have, bang, uh, an outbreak can cause a lot of defoliation very quickly. The other thing about uh, gypsy moth is that it, it defoliates many different species. Um, it doesn't seem to be very picky, um, but it loves hardwoods. And the hardwoods that it likes the most are oaks. I mentioned that um, if you are in an oak dominated forest type, um, that's where the gypsy moth will appear and start to spread from there. But it also loves basswood. It loves uh, black cherry. It loves fruit trees. So if you've got apple trees or pear trees or even crab apple trees, it loves uh, those uh, species. All species of poplar, including large tooth aspen, trembling aspen and balsam poplar loves white birch. Uh, it loves some of the elms, uh, not all of them. Uh, willows. It will feed on sugar maple. It will feed on beech. And uh, for the first time ever in my life, I noticed a pest that likes eating ironwood. I've got a lot of ironwood in my woodlot and I've been kind of harvesting a lot, trying to release maple from below. And so maybe the gypsy moth is here to help me release my maple region. I don't know. The conifers though, um, this is what makes it different from other um, species like forest tank caterpillar that we had here earlier in that gypsy moth will eat conifers and um, top of the list is white pine. Uh, it will eat white and blue spruce. I was, I was kind of shocked about blue spruce. I have one on my front lawn and you know, it's, it's kind of out of place when you live in a woodlot. Why do you have a blue spruce on your front lawn? But it, it was my only blue spruce and all of a sudden I looked up um, sometime about uh, mid-June last year and I said, holy smokes, the crown has been eaten right out of that spruce tree. Got up closer and sure enough, it was gypsy moth munching away happily. And uh, uh, it will eat my, it'll eat balsam fir, it'll eat hemlock, it will even eat larch. So um, it starts to really get in your face when it's got a long list of species like this that it will eat. But then uh, just to completely endear itself to you, uh, it likes eating all your garden shrubs and garden plants as well, especially rose bushes. The other thing about gypsy moth that makes it so bad compared to some of our native pests is that it's considered to be a late season defoliator, meaning that it, it doesn't finish feeding until early to mid July, depending on when it hatched out. So hardwoods, all that list of hardwoods that I spoke about on the last slide, they can refoliate if environmental conditions are favorable. And usually hardwoods will not need to refoliate if they've suffered less than 50% defoliation. I don't know how the trees figured it out, but there's a, a cost benefit analysis that went on there and said, okay, we better put out a new set of leaves because it uses valuable starch reserves to do that, which then puts uh, stress on the tree but it also coincides with the heat of the summer and drought. And so the tree's already going into a period of check, uh, you know, just kind of surviving the heat and the drought and then bang, there it's got to use its valuable starch reserves to refoliate. So it puts long-term stress on the tree. 
Conifers, on the other hand, cannot refoliate. Uh, their growth strategy is to hang on to all of their old needles. That's why they're called evergreens. And uh, they require all that old foliage to uh, complete their photosynthetic requirements. So if you strip off all the old needles, uh, the only opportunity that that conifer has to refoliate comes in the following year when the uh, buds expand and grow new needles. But if the gypsy moth follow and re uh, defoliate that conifer two years in a row, uh, my biggest concern is that these trees will not recover and many conifers may die as a result of um, successive years of gypsy moth defoliation. Uh, gypsy moth is also a non-native insect, so it has few natural predators. Uh, some of our native species have figured out, you know, that they can try to eat this. Um, typically, it would be the same um, predators that would feed on forest tank caterpillar and other lep ep lepidopteran species. Um, so without predators, uh, the population can basically, um, you know, complete its life cycle undeterred. And then, of course, um, there's a lot of nuisance and human health issues associated with gypsy moth. And this year, for the first time, I was starting to get, get a lot of reports, a lot of questions about gypsy moth. You know, people didn't understand what was going on, but they said, I, I'm getting bitten by gypsy moth. These things are biting me. And I said, oh, that's impossible. A gypsy moth is, it, it feeds on leaves. It doesn't bite people. Um, but people were showing me their arms, showing me their necks. And here's a picture um, from a, a fellow named Andrew Combs who uh, lives near the Aurelia area. And he actually put this in the local paper because he didn't know what it was. Uh, no one seemed to know what it was, and he was putting out a call for others to say, are you suffering through the same thing that I am? So with a little bit of research, um, you know, it's, it's clear that each caterpillar, um, as it goes through its various instars, will shed its bristly skin four or five times as it grows, and these skins will pile up. And the, the, the bristles that are there, or the little hairs, or the setae on the caterpillar, will become dislodged and will become airborne. And so they can land on you or they can land on things that you touch on your patio furniture, on your hammock, uh, on your, you know, uh, your, even on your lawn tractor, wherever. And it can end up irritating you, um, either if it comes into direct contact with your uh, eyes, your skin, or even your respiratory system. So this is like an allergic reaction and people develop a rash very similar to poison ivy. So uh, a lot of doctors weren't familiar with this. And gypsy moth are not the only type of caterpillar that can cause this. So if you're interested in finding out more, I put a link here to an article that talks about the various types of caterpillars, including those ones that you see in the fall, woolly bears, et cetera, uh, can all have the same effect. What to do about this? Uh, I, I'm not a doctor, but people have been trying hydrocortisone creams and some antihistamines and stuff like that. But if you have this condition, I would suggest, number one, uh, that you wear protective clothing outdoors. So the same outfit you were wearing outdoors now because of um, the black-legged tick, well, that's probably a good outfit to wear for gypsy moth as well. But if you've got a bad rash, um, you need to seek medical attention from your doctor on that front. Excuse me, Eric. I'm yes, just John. Thinking this is a good time for a, a poll on the, the health impacts we've got set up. If, if you're okay with that, I'll give you a break and get a drink of water too. So, okay, perfect. Yep. So I'm going to launch this poll. Just uh, it's about health issues and, and ask folks to, uh, to complete it. If you had any sort of experience, any negative personal health issues because of gypsy moth, maybe just uh, pick them. And if you didn't have any, don't don't worry about it. But oh, we're getting a lot of votes. That's good. I'll give it about uh, thirty more seconds. Lots of people voting on the different options there. Oh, 
Okay, I think we're just about done. I'm going to end the polling and share the results. It looks like about well, a little less than half the, the group has had some kind of some kind of issue. And the number one is rash at 60 percent, 159 people. Difficulties breathing, 21. Anguish and emotional issues, I can understand that. It's very, very frustrating to see your trees being chomped on 152 and other. So thanks for voting there and giving us that insight, folks. That the, uh, the anguish one is, is very interesting. I've had lots of conversations with people and people have, we'll, we'll go through the control and the mitigation strategies in a few slides, but they tell me I've done everything. I've scraped egg masses. I've uh, sprayed my trees and these things are everywhere. I, I scraped every single egg mass off my apple tree and yet it was covered in gypsy moss. So people are getting very concerned about the health of their tree and, and feeling a little bit powerless and, and helpless in terms of what they can do. Um, because the scale of this infestation is so large and your ability to intervene as an individual, uh, these two things aren't, aren't compatible. Like if there's a lot of people that aren't doing anything, there's a lot of people that aren't concerned at all. Um, so, you know, gypsy moth are going to do what gypsy moth do and they're gonna spread and they're gonna find food and they're gonna complete their life cycle. And you're irrelevant to them basically. So the anguish comes from worrying about your forest and feeling a bit helpless about your ability to help your trees. There's also a nuisance factor and um, I got some slides here. So frass is the caterpillar droppings. Um, anybody who's in a high infestation zone right now will know what I'm talking about, but you could just walk through your woods and you can hear the frass raining down from the canopy. It sounds like rain and it's, um, uh, when you, when you think about the quantity of frass coming down from the canopy, you realize how much foliage is getting consumed. And uh, that's, that's part, part of the anguish, I suppose. Uh, the, the frass ends up on, on, on your deck, on your furniture, it accumulates. Um, and if we get rain and it washes off, these, these are highly nutritious droppings and they can uh, cause some um, excess nutrient loading into your local watershed. But I got a couple of pictures here. The one on the left with the pine needles just shows how not only is there frass, but there's unconsumed and yet uh, defoliated pine needles on the deck. And the picture on the bottom with the blue patio chairs, you can see unconsumed uh, portions of hardwood leaves along with the frass. So the caterpillars are voracious, but they're not very efficient eaters. They do not start at the tip of a pine needle and work its way down like we would a cob of corn. They basically chomp on it. And if the top falls off, oh, well, I'll get another needle to chomp on. So they're, they're wasting a lot of food uh, and um, causing a lot of defoliation as they go. So that's a little bit of the history of uh, and the life cycle of gypsy moth. Um, Thinking back to that life cycle diagram I showed you earlier, there's lots of ways that you can intervene at these various stages in the life cycle. So a lot of people uh, getting ready for 2021, uh, one of the things that they could do and did do an awful lot of was egg mass scraping. Number one, you can find those egg masses. Um, they're pretty obvious on the, on the trunk of the tree. Some of them are hidden, um, so you don't find all of them. And of course, some of them are way too high up a tree, so you can't get at them. But it, it was certainly um, a way that you could uh, reduce the potential population. So again, back to the math story, 100 to 300 eggs per egg mass. So every egg mass that you scrape off took that many potential caterpillars out of the equation. Others uh, tried using dormant oil spray. Um, I, I read about it, it can work. So I'd be interested in, in if anybody tried it, um, what their observations were about the effectiveness of dormant oil. Others use torching, um, basically like a little butane or propane torch and uh, just burn the 
the egg mass is in situ on the bark of the tree. Uh, I, that works great if you've got a nice thick bark tree, but I wouldn't suggest it on, on thin barked trees or younger trees. And others um, were scraping them off and then using handheld battery powered vacuums to suck up the egg masses. Because it's really important um, if you're gonna go through the egg mass scraping effort that you need to remove and destroy the eggs. Don't just scrape them onto the ground because those eggs will likely hatch. In fact, you might've even given them a better chance of survival if they were now under the snow cover. Um, they'll find their way up the, into the tree just because they weren't congregated to begin with. So uh, if you're gonna scrape, destroy. And lots of suggestions on how to destroy eggs, uh, soap and water, soak them for a few days, that kind of stuff. But my own personal favorite was to uh, accumulate these egg masses and throw them into the wood stove and they make a very, very satisfying crackling noise as they, um, as they burn up and you go, there you go, take that. Uh, another thing that uh, people were wondering about was, is there any overwinter egg mass mortality? You know, will cold temperatures have an impact on the survival of the eggs in the egg mass? Well, um, I've read some reports that say um, prolonged periods of minus 20 temperatures can have an effect. I've read other reports that say, no, no, it has to be as uh, cold as minus 30. But um, regardless, uh, this past winter was a fairly benign winter. We didn't have a lot of snow. We didn't have a lot of cold. There was maybe a period of about five to six days of minus 20. Um, I did my own uh, little experiment on this one. I gathered eggs that were below the snow level and kept them in a bag. And then I gathered eggs that were above the snow level and put them in another bag and then watched as they uh, hatched out in the springtime. And both bags hatched out equally as well. So I don't think there was any suggestion that the minus 20 temperatures had any impact on the egg masses themselves this year. Maybe other people have different observations. I did notice um, some egg mass predation by small birds, chickadees, nuthatches, um, uh, brown creepers, uh, those types of birds that like to kind of forage in the branches of trees. Um, and I saw egg masses that have been picked at, but I followed up on some of them as well. And the eggs that did not get consumed out of the, out of the uh, egg masses that were picked at, uh, the rest of the eggs hatched. So it helped. Uh, thank you, chickadees. But um, again, I don't think it had enough of an impact on the gypsy moth population. The other thing that people did in 2021 was getting prepared to spray, either at a large scale or a small scale. And we've got um, uh, both uh, Susan Freeman and Craig Greenwood here to talk to us today about their experience with spraying. So I won't say much more about that. The hatch begins. Um, and this started in May. Um, egg masses begin to hatch based on accumulated heat. So here's a kind of a geoclimatic um, temperature map of Southern Ontario. It's produced by BioForest using the BioSim um, um, mapping program using Environment Canada data. So I look at the color coding. Um, it says 90% of the egg masses should hatch by the dates in the scale on the right hand side. So if you look at the kind of light green, you can see Smith Falls, Brockville, Ogdensburg, uh, that's where I'm at. And it predicted that 90% of the egg masses would have hatched out by May 17th or 19th based on this accumulated heat days. So the operational uh, people will use this as a way of predicting when they need to start aerial spraying or, or ground spraying uh, because you like to intervene with the, um, the larval development at the earlier stages. So this, this resource is available for all and it's a very interesting uh, way of looking at gypsy moth in response to climate. But here's my own little diary. I kept uh, notes um, of what's going to happen. So I live in Maberly, Ontario. If you don't know where that is, it's Western Lanark County, halfway between Charbot Lake and Perth, Ontario. So a whole bunch of little dates here, but I'm going I'm to hit the highlights. Um, I figured my 90% hatch happened on May 19th. This is also when oak leaves had 50% elongated. 
So I'm going to go back to this slide. This would have predicted that the 90% hatch would have happened for me on May 17th and 19th. And I found that it happened just a little bit earlier. And I think the, the reason was, is although May started off cold, it was dry and it heated up quickly and the larvae were responding to that accumulated heat, as well as understanding that the leaves were on the trees. Now it was time to start getting uh, going. So they, they stuck around their egg mass site, like you can see in the picture on the top right, uh, for a few days. On May 17th, we kind of shifted temperature. Uh, all of a sudden we started getting into that hot, dry weather and it blew in on southwest winds uh, of up to 30 kilometer an hour gusts. Well, the very next day, uh, the amount of larvae I've seen everywhere by everybody. So the bottom left picture, it's hard to see, but that's a, a kind of a guard post at our fire department. Like it's nowhere near a tree. Uh, it's in the middle of a paved parking area. And here are the equivalent of about 500 larval gypsy moth on this guard post. Where did they come from? Well, they blew in on that wind. These little larvae weigh nothing. They balloon up, they, they crawl up to the top of the crown, they get carried by the wind and they can just get blown long distances. So this is where people were shocked that, you know, they said, I, I scraped all my egg masses. Where'd these gypsy moths come from? Well, they could have come from as far away as 10 or 15 kilometers away. They just blew in on the wind. So by May 25th, um, you know, feeding had already commenced. There was already heavily uh, feeding on some of the preferred species. It was a cool morning and I, I heard uh, the spray helicopters uh, for the first time in our neck of the woods at that time. So they timed it, you know, for earlier instar developments. Uh, they needed that cool morning, uh, light winds and high relative humidities. By June 1st, uh, the, uh, there's a picture of the larval stages. Um, you know, we we're already into the fourth instar, the, the, the large caterpillar on the right, but I was seeing first, second, and third instars along with the fourth instars, and that's because the hatch doesn't happen all at once. It's staggered, and I think um, um, I'm trying to understand the biology behind that, but I think it's the species has figured out that, you know, we may, we better save some people or some caterpillars in case there's a heavy frost so that the late hatchers can uh, then carry on the population. Uh, June 3rd and 4th, last week, there was a bit of rain finally around here. And all of the larvae that had been up in the crown and out of your sight, all of a sudden descended from the crown and were crawling over everything again. So all of a sudden people are going, oh my God, where did these things come from? So the picture on the bottom right is uh, today's caterpillar, um, approaching four centimeters in length, we're at peak fourth in star right now and they're feeding non-stop so your intervention options are to, to follow an integrated pest management approach that means really trying to keep our trees healthy to begin with and trying to intervene uh, in the uh, in the uh, problem that's facing your tree in whatever way you can so the small scale control options we've heard a lot of um uh discussion about this already. So hand spraying of selected trees, you can get yourself a little one gallon or, or sorry, one gallon, four liter or 15 liter uh, uh, type sprayer, pump up sprayer, pressurized sprayer. And those are pretty good. Uh, they'll cover your fruit trees. They'll cover trees up to 20 feet tall. They certainly will not help you on your 70, 100 foot tall oak trees. But again, you're, you're helping to knock the population back. Uh, the burlap bag traps, there's a schematic on the right side to show you how to do that properly. You're, you're basically making a skirt of burlap or towel or any kind of fabric around the tree. And when the caterpillars get to the later instars, they will descend from the crown uh, during the daytime and hide uh, at near the base. And then they'll go back and feed at night again, trying to escape the heat basically. And um, so you can intervene in this, this pattern of uh, going up and down um, the tree and they'll hide in your burlap trap and you can scoop them out and destroy them in whatever your favorite way of destroying them are. Uh, a lot of people tried uh, 
intervening in uh, using sticky substances um, and this up and down motion up the crown every day. So Tanglefoot is a, um, a commercially available product. Um, I didn't try that, so I'm not sure how well it used, uh, worked. Uh, I did try some tuck tape uh, inside out and I found it did kind of work uh, for the very small instars. Uh, the later instars, it didn't work at all. But interestingly, although they didn't get stuck on the tape, they seemed to not want to cross it. So they were bunched up almost like they were hiding underneath it uh, at the bottom. So I was able to just go around and, and kill them here. But I think if these ones can't get up, it means the ones that are up here can't get down. So I don't know what we've accomplished um, with this kind of method. Uh, the other thing you can use, of course, is a contact insecticide, uh, you know, homeowner um, product like Raid or something like that will also kill uh, caterpillars at this stage. Eric, I'm thinking we could do another poll quickly, if you don't mind. Oh, that'd be great, John. Sure. Yeah. So is, there's two questions to this one. And it's just asking folks, uh, what was their top choice method? of controlling caterpillars this year if, if they tried anything. So I'm going to launch that poll. And there's a second question, a follow-up question for your second uh, top choice. But if you could just uh, kind of answer this question, that would help us to understand what people are trying out there as, as, uh, as their top choice method of controlling caterpillars. OK, and I can see folks starting to select. That's great. Thank you. And of course, if you didn't do anything, don't worry about it. We're at uh, 561 people now. That's pretty impressive. We'll give that another 20, 25 seconds. Yeah, just so folks know, I'm, I'm watching the questions and the chat and we'll, we'll answer everything at the end and get as much time as we can to to getting some answers out there. Okay, I'm gonna stop the polling and share the results. So it looks like uh, squishing the larvae was uh, the top. I guess there's a lot of satisfaction <laughs> in that. And then uh, scraping and destroying egg masses before the hatch, the, the banding individual trees with burlap was popular. Small scale spraying, at homeowner level, the BTK and raid. Wow, okay, that's really good. All right, I'm just gonna stop that one and I'll launch the second question here. And it's basically the same question, but it's asking what your your second choice was. Here we go. If you had a second method that you, you tried, a secondary method, one, one that uh, you used. And we're getting lots of voting again, that's great. There's quite a backlog of questions for you, Eric, and Susan and Craig, so. <laughs> I'm gonna redirect them to Jim McCready. Yeah, okay. All right, I'll give it another 15 seconds or so here. I'm gonna end the polling. And I'll share the results again. So again, squishy <laughs> larva was pretty popular there for the second. <laughs> and uh, that is some, some really uh, heavy handed folks. Oh, just kidding. Uh, banding individual trees with burlap was popular, small scale spraying and, uh, and scraping and destroying the egg masses. Okay. Questions keep popping up here. I can't, I'm gonna stop sharing the results. Okay, there it is. It's, it's funny on the last one, sold my house and moving to an apartment. We've had, uh, because of the COVID pandemic, so many people that are doing the exact opposite, moving out of their apartment and um, moving out to the country. And, and their very first exposure to country living is a gypsy moth infestation. And they're going, oh my God, what have I done? So of course, if you've been living out in the woodlot for years, you've seen stuff like this come and go in the past. And you maybe can take it in stride, but if this is a new problem for you, it's, I can under, appreciate it. It's, it's overwhelming. 
Okay, moving on now uh, to some bigger scale and more heavy handed options uh, to control the pests. And this is all part of the integrated pest management approach. There are a number of pesticides that can be used. And I was getting some questions ahead of time wanting to make sure that I addressed pesticide use. But I, just a couple of warnings that um, all pesticide products in, in, in the country are regulated by the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, which is part of Health Canada. There's their website if you want to see how they do their business. But their whole point is to make sure that the product is safe uh, to be used by people. And if it isn't, um, it's telling you what kind of uh, protective and mitigation uh, measures you should take. But also make sure that it's efficacious, that it actually works on the thing that it says it will work on. So they're there to make sure that there's only you know, safe and effective products available. Then in the province, the Ministry of the Environment and Conservation and Parks will cl classify the pesticides under the Pesticides Act. And uh, there, the Pesticides Act says the products must be used according to the label. So I, I think people will know that a number of years ago, the availability of pesticides, whether that's herbicides, insecticides, whatever, for homeowners was um, uh, curtailed. Um, so fewer formulations, fewer types of products available for homeowners. And that's to make sure that there's no unintended use of some of those products, but it's also to keep the public safe. Um, class seven pesticides are controlled sale products. And that's some of the stuff that was being used for gypsy moth. I'll go through that in a second. So not all pesticides are available to homeowners, so it's not an option for you. But if you do work with a licensed applicator, whether it's an arborist or um, the aerial spray company, um, those people can access it because they're properly trained in both the use, storage, and safety aspects of the product. So what, what products are available? And number one on the list is a product called BTK. And BTK is just an abbreviation of Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki. It is a biological certified um, bacillus or bacteria. Um, it's used in uh, organic operations. It is deemed to be safe because it uh, targets only Lepidopteran species which are um, moths and butterflies. And properly applied, it doesn't uh, affect um, water, it doesn't affect aquatic species, it doesn't affect non-target species. So it's seen as the um, pesticide of choice. Um, it's best applied to early stages of larval development. The, the caterpillars have to ingest uh, the bacillus that's sprayed onto the trees, and then it disrupts their uh, digestive system. And it comes in a number of different formulations. So this is the stuff that's available both in large scale to the aerial uh, spray companies, but it's also available in very small packaging to the homeowner. I'll go through that in a second. Other products uh, less available and less in use are Mimic, which is a growth regulator. It basically causes the caterpillars after it ingests this stuff to uh, grow out of its own exoskeleton and the, the next uh, stage of molting is, is not formed properly. So it basically falls apart. Seven is uh, uh, a synthetic uh, pesticide. Uh, Carbaryl is the uh, product name and it, it controls a lot of things. So it isn't, uh, it's not very, um, it's a broad spectrum uh, insecticide. So it will kill a lot of other species besides gypsy moss. So it's again, not used regularly in forestry control programs. Then there's another product called Dispervirus, which is um, uh, taking the MPV virus that we'll talk about in a minute and uh, preparing it in larger formulations and then spraying it over areas. It's actually uh, developed in Canada by the CFS and MNR, but again, it's not available to the homeowner. And then of course there's others if you manage to get into a hardware store and look at stuff on the shelf so there's various forms of pyrethrins permethrins and even some malathion that might be still available all of which say effective against crawling insects including gypsy moth but again that's for very small scale applications so just 
on on this, um, you know, read the label and use appropriately. I've heard people making up their own stuff and that's great, but don't tell me. Uh, so I'm going to shift gears now. I'm going to turn it over to um, both Susan and Craig. But before we do, just here's some visuals on these uh, kind of larger scale options. So there's an aerial spray helicopter uh, misting out uh, just not very far above the canopy of the trees. The bottom right picture, arborists can uh, use the boom trucks like you see hydro using. So they can spray from the ground, but up into the canopy of trees. And then here's a picture of the small packaging version of BTK that you can get at hardware stores. I understand it was hard to get your hands on it this year, uh, but that's, if you can find it, that's the stuff you wanna get. So Susan, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Just let me know when you want me to change the slides. Okay, thank you, Eric. Well, good evening. Uh, I live in Burgess Wood. It's a wooded subdivision about nine kilometers southwest of Perth. We have two roads, 70 properties, each about two to four acres each, some smaller, some larger. And collectively, we own 215 acres of common land. There's trails, ponds, bush, forest in this common land. And we also uh, own part of access to Artie Lake, which is heavily treated with beautiful pines. We have a property owners association and our volunteers do all the work on our common land. In November, 2019 at a community association meeting, two of our members, Dan Woods and Wendy Haufman, um, they came with us with samples of gypsy moth uh, egg sacs and warned us of the upcoming uh, and the imminent infestation of gypsy moth. And this brought the community's attention to it, uh, really for the first time for most of us. We looked at ways to ameliorate the situation that we were going to face. And we looked at all of the ways that Eric has just described to you. But we also looked at aerial spraying and we thought that if we could mobilize the community to aerial spray, it'd be the best way to help our trees. And so what we did is we formed a committee of five dedicated members uh, to form a subcommittee who then researched everything they could about gypsy moth uh, everything they could about BTK, aerial spraying, what individuals can do on their own properties, and also what would be the cost of doing nothing. We also, uh, as a community, uh, had a couple of outdoor, because it was a pandemic, community meetings where answered people's questions and we encouraged them to sign up for aerial spraying because at this point we had identified Zimmer Airways as probably the only possible way we could get aerial spraying for this spring. We sent information to all of our members and we encouraged them to sign up for spraying through Zimmer. We wanted to make it as easy as possible for our community to do this. And we helped people with filling out the contracts, getting the waivers, making sure our township uh, didn't mind that there was spray on their road allowances. And our goal was to make it also easy for Zimmer uh, by giving them the packages as a package, the contracts as a package with the waivers and maps. And this took us from last summer, probably to the fall. And I think we had about 96% of our property owners sign up for aerial spraying. 
Zimmer only charges you once you've they just before they sprayed. And you might ask me how much it cost me. Well, for our property, it's about two and a half acres, and it cost us about five hundred dollars. For our common land, the community spent eleven thousand dollars. This spring, uh, knowing we were going to be sprayed hopefully in May, June, uh, we distributed another package to all of our community about what to expect and what to do before the spray, during the spray and after the spray, protecting the garden furniture and things like that. And if they're sensitive to make sure the windows are closed and they stay indoors. By this point, we were down to two point people, myself doing communications within the community and Craig Greenwood, who was doing the communications with Zimmer. My communications with the community was through a community email list, uh, our bulletin board, uh, community bulletin board, and a private Facebook page and phone calls. And also, during pandemic, as we walk around, because you either walk left or right, talking to people. And then uh, we came to the actual spraying in the last couple of weeks. And I then talked to our community through these channels because there's been a lot of anxiety, a lot of questions, why were they hearing helicopters at one end of the community and not at the other? And so that's what we did. Uh, I think it was a very successful organizational community effort. And people are talking about whether we should do it again for next year, knowing what's going to happen. At this point, I will hand it over to Craig and I'll say thank you. I'll, uh, I'll just show you my face briefly so you can know that I'm alive. I'm uh, follically challenged uh, so the, the glare uh, would blind you. Uh, but I have also a slow internet. So I'm going to cut off my video and I'll just speak with you. Uh, my love affair with BT actually started back in the early 80s when I was uh, a biologist with the Ministry of Natural Resources in the first experimental spraying of BT on spruce budwork. And it was quite, uh, quite effective at that time, broad-based broad uh, uh, spraying of the forest. So we completed, as Susan said, and thank you, Susan. Um, and I, I want to thank uh, Eric for inviting us to be part of this. It, uh, it uh, is an interesting story for us. So in around October 30th, we, we put together a complete package for the mayor's service. And we had the contracts, the waivers, the various authorizations common land, data summaries, graphics, um, and, and we created a very comprehensive database. And that allowed me to do a lot of troubleshooting with Zimmer. So it was basically, <clears throat> excuse me, one-on-one -on -one contact. And we, uh, again, we had a fairly comprehensive database and I was able to work with Zimmer directly and in, in, uh, working through our spray package, which was a complicated spray package because we had buffers, common lands, shorelines, uh, private property, some uh, outside of Burgesswood. Uh, we also had some property owners, uh, as Susan mentioned, five out of 70, 70 property owners that didn't wish to be sprayed or uh, had other means that they wanted to uh, approach the problem with. Um, so it was, it was fairly complex. Uh, the single point of con uh, contact uh, with the Zimmer Service for community-based issues it, it worked really quite well. Uh, I developed a relationship with one of the pilots that was pulling all of the GPS stuff uh, together and the, the data for our, our properties. Um, but we started early and got it in early. And as I said, it was a bit of a calm, it was a, an oddball. Uh, and uh, Zimmer Air Service was extremely accommodating. And now that we've gone through it, I really marvel that they, that they were so accommodating. Uh, I'm not sure I would have been if I had owned the the helicopter service, given the complexity. Um, and we, as I said, we had standing water, which was eliminated. We had high value waterfront. 
And as Susan says, we have a, a, a mixed wood forest here, which uh, has many mature uh, hardwoods and pines. And it's really the white pines that uh, we've been very concerned about. So there was high values that we want to protect it. So in, in uh, May, I put together another final checklist of the final properties that were going to be sprayed just to make sure no one got uh, missed. Now I did ask Paul Zimmer, was any of this of much value to you? Uh, because of course they have a tremendous amount of work that they're doing with the GPS coordinates and what have you. And he said he confirmed that it was very helpful to them. So on, on June 1st, we, we had our, our uh, first spray. We were already seeing uh, damage to the oaks and, and extensively to the oaks and poplar and other things were starting to get munched. Um, weather was an issue. Um, one of the things is, is Zimmer Air Service was just overwhelmed with requests to spray. And the other uh, major issue, as, as uh, Eric pointed out, was the hatching. It didn't actually, the uh, animal didn't hatch as was predicted with the warm weather, it was more of a synchronous hatch over a broad geographic area. And Zoom Air Service cannot be at all places at the same time. So we were probably about seven to 10 days late in, in our first spray, uh, which meant that there was less effect on the uh, first instar. Um, we had our second sprays on the 7th, 9th, and 10th. One of the things they were committed to trying to do the best job they could. And what affects the efficacy of the spray is humidity, wind, temperature, and precipitation. So we missed a bunch of days that, were, uh, that we were hopeful of spraying. And as I mentioned, we, we had 65 of 70 properties sprayed. That's two sprays. And we had about 175 acres of our common land sprayed, uh, most of it one time, uh, but we did a two times uh, buffer against the uh, spray against the uh, Burgess Wood property owners. We don't have any objective data. We, we talked about it and as a science guy, or, uh, um, I had some sort of thoughts, maybe we could do some, some uh, uh, objective sampling, but we decided that, that we would. And so the info we have on success is, is anecdotal. So we will change slides to the next one. So, so the lessons and observations, and, and some of these are, are uh, as I, I compiled it, so it may be reflective of my words rather than a broad community uh, consensus, because there are a variety of, of opinions. Uh, the actual spraying was driven by model and practical logistics and weather, and all of the things that they consider the biosims model. So getting into our package in very early didn't give us a leg up on anybody else. But what it did do is got us into the queue. And I think that's something uh, important to consider for the future. The other thing was we had good communication with Zimmer Air Service and it was ongoing. Um, one of the challenges was when it came to the actual spray dates, the spray times. It was really dependent upon the helicopter pilots contacting me and saying we're spraying tomorrow, the weather's going to be okay, and so on, so so forth. <clears throat> but I, I had to appreciate and understand they were extremely busy. They, you know, they've got all these clients across Ontario spray my trees for dying, and so they had a tremendous amount of competing uh, uh, demands. But I, I thought, from my perspective, they did their very best. And uh, um, they do have on their website uh, an up-to-date uh, or relatively up-to-date page that does show when they expect to spray. That also created expectations on the part of people. Oh, they're going to spray tomorrow because I'm in the window. Well, that didn't happen. And it's delayed. So then people get discouraged. So there's some realities here that people have to, uh, um, to be in mind of. Uh, and as I said, there were some specific real-time needs. We have some people that keep bees. We have some people that are, are severely health compromised. And they wanted to know when the spray was actually going to happen. So that created some interesting challenges. <clears throat> I, we'll go to the next slide. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is to have a, a good understanding of what a spray will do and what a spray won't do. If you're thinking it's going to kill 100% of the, uh, the caterpillars, that's unrealistic. The success of the spray is dependent upon many things. Uh, the instar that you catch them at, the uh, weather conditions, and a number of other things. So it's, it's uh, really important, again, to, to manage expectations. 
there are no guarantees uh, and people get anxious. <clears throat> the, um, uh, as I say, from a Zimmer Air Services perspective, the competing demands of customers, and I spoke to Paul several times as well as his staff, and, and people were beating down the doors, you gotta spray, you gotta spray. And a lot of people came on very late. They realized that this was going to be a big deal and uh, tried to contract and services late. And he tried to accommodate people. <clears throat> Excuse me, spray effectiveness. The story is still unfolding. It's kind of hard to know what the, uh, whether there's MPV that's at, at play right now. We're seeing dead um, uh, caterpillars. We've done our own little informal survey on my property by counting dead caterpillars on the, on the deck. Um, and so we've seen some success. Um, was it the right uh, decision? From my perspective, yes, it absolutely was. And why? Because if we did nothing, our trees would be much more severely impacted than they are. As a community, we'll have to wait and see what the community feels like. But I think the cost of doing uh, nothing is extremely high. And I wanted to put this line in because as a, as a, a biologist that uh, uh, practiced biology for a number of years before going to the dark side in the management, um, would often say, let mother nature take its course. But when you're a property owner and rather than the holistic approach, you're seeing your 150 year old pine tree dying. Um, the holistic approach goes out the window to you as an individual in that property. And you'll do what you can do practically to, to protect your trees. Uh, the other thing I would leave you with is there's no control over operational elements. So while Zimmer would do their very uh, level best, you've got to recognize that gypsy moss only occur uh, periodically. So you can't have a large company geared to just um, uh, controlling Gypsy Moth. He's a relatively small operator. But as I said to Paul when, when uh, he was concerned about some of the criticism that he was receiving from people, he's the only game in town. Uh, we did contact a, a Quebec firm. They responded once and then we, I never heard from them again. And you have no control over the environmental conditions in Mother Nature. At any rate, so I think that sort of wraps up uh, what I would say. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Craig and Susan. Um, I really appreciated this perspective because when we were talking about options last February, we talked about aerospray, but it was a theoretical kind of approach. Uh, this real life uh, experience now and your observation and lessons learned, I think it'd be valuable for anybody who's on the webinar tonight or who will listen later on to consider because it is operationally challenging. Um, it's biologically challenging and it's uh, human challenging. You've got to get a lot of people lined up uh, to, uh, to a, a shared objective. And I think that's a big challenge. So anyhow, um, I thought I'd follow up because I did get some pictures from people um, that did get sprayed. Uh, so the, the, the top line of photographs comes from the Ganaraska area. And you can see on the left hand side, uh, sprayed versus no spray. So you, you can see a clear difference. And the one thing I'll note on the sprayed side, it's not 100% protection of foliage. It's not like it never happened. What your objective there is to save enough of the foliage so that the tree does not need to refoliate, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation. And like some of the other trees you're seeing there are trees which are not on the preferred species list. But when you look at the unsprayed pictures, um, it's very telling. There's 100% defoliation in some of those oaks and you can see some of the pines are already very thin crown. Uh, the second set of photos comes from the same geographic area uh, from the Northumberland uh, County area and comes from a friend of mine, Fraser Smith, who's a consulting forester. And um, again, um, not 100% foliage protection, but it looks a lot greener than the unsprayed one. So. You know, if it works, it can work well. And then uh, there's other examples where, you know, the environmental conditions weren't favorable or the stage of bug development wasn't favorable. So you have to go into aerial spraying with your eyes wide open on a number of fronts. So that kind of wraps up uh, the uh, where we're at. So here we are on June 10th. And, and the good news for everybody 
should be that we're more than halfway through the feeding cycle now. But I suppose the bad news is that we still have halfway to go. So if you're looking out your window now and you still see some leaves on some trees like I am, I still have some leaves in some of my basswood, you know, two or three more weeks of feeding and those leaves might not be there. So it's important to watch the progression of the defoliation as much as the overall impact. So at this point, your small scale control options are now pretty much limited. Um, so your burlap uh, hiding bands and trapping, um, the perimeter search of your property and squishing every caterpillar you can find, that's about all you can do. But you should know that really none of those things um, are going to affect the population, uh, but it sure makes you feel like you're doing something and that makes you feel good too, um, that you're actually taking a proactive approach to this. But more importantly for me, is now is the time to start watching for the natural population control factors to kick in. And there's two, the, the MPV virus that um, I mentioned earlier and the Entomophagomyomyga fungus. I'll, I'll, I got a couple of slides of, more, of those things in more detail, but there are other parasites. Uh, there's mammals that will feed on the, uh, the caterpillars and there's birds. And the birds I'm, I'm most excited about is um, I've got maybe three or four nesting pairs of uh, the black-billed cuckoo in my 200 acre woods. And you can hear them, uh, they're a phenomenal bird. And they are a hairy caterpillar feeding specialist. They, they seem to be able to consume these things. And I understand um, they have a, a special stomach lining. So as they ingest the caterpillars, they're able to cough up the, the caterpillar hairs much like an owl coughs up um, uh, some of the prey that it uh, has consumed. But the next best, best chance for us to intervene is at the pupil stage. And here's a picture of my clothesline stand from last year. I went underneath just at the time that the caterpillars had finished feeding and I didn't see very many of them. And I, I went underneath the deck and there they all were congregated uh, there's a lot of them. They all seem to like to find these hidden shady nooks. So I was able to scoop up at this stage hundreds and hundreds of caterpillars and destroy them then. So every caterpillar I got at this stage did not become an adult and an adult was not able to reproduce and, and it didn't produce eggs. So you know again it's a math issue. I think um, this is a good opportunity. So when you've seen the cycle finished and you see the male moths flying around, look for the females and uh, intervene at that stage. And then of course, um, we have to hope for a bit of rain here to help the trees recover from defoliation. So just to wrap up what natural factors will control the temperature, as I mentioned, uh, sorry, control the population. As I mentioned, cold temperatures less than minus 20 have been noted to cause some egg mass mortality. But uh, really what happens is the population collapses when there are so many caterpillars that they start running out of food before they're able to complete their life cycle. So their, their starvation kicks in, competition kicks in, stress kicks into the population. And when the population is stressed, uh, the NPV or the nucleopolyhydrosis virus really starts to kick in. These caterpillars carry this virus load with them all the time, but the virus really doesn't express itself until there is a stress in the population. So the higher the density of caterpillars, the more likely it is that the NPV virus will express itself. Conversely, the fungus is the density independent mortality factor. It really, it's like any fungus, it really, um, starts to uh, do well in cool, wet spring weather. So if you think back on 2020, did we have a cool, wet spring? No. Uh, thinking of 2021, did we have a cool, wet spring this year? No. So hasn't been a lot of fungus around. Um, so our best hope right now is for the MPV to show up. But you might see some of these parasitic wasps and some of the beetles that will feed on uh, the um, on the caterpillars themselves, and then some other flies that will uh, parasitize the egg masses after they've been laid. 
So a little bit more on these two things and what to look for. And it's pretty, um, these are very diagnostic kind of features. So if the caterpillars have been affected by the fungus, what they do is they hang head down, hanging onto the trunk or the branch of the tree by their last set of legs. They start to elongate out as they disintegrate and the, the fungus will um, release spores and the spores will then affect other caterpillars. Eventually, uh, these caterpillars will fall off the tree and the spores overwinter in the soil. So, you know, as the population builds over years, the fungus uh, spore load increases as well. We just need that cool wet weather for it to express itself. Conversely, the gypsy moth virus, the MPV virus, um, is, is a virus and um, it affects uh, populations under stress, as I mentioned. So its diagnostic features, when the caterpillar hangs off the branch or the trunk by its middle set of legs, with its head drooped down and its tail dro drooped down in this characteristic upside down V. Um, so just to give you a little bit of encouragement, this picture here on the bottom right is one that I took at my place um, on June the 1st or 2nd, I think. So I started to see some virus starting to show up. Unfortunately, it's not abundant, um, but nevertheless, it's there. So, you know, hopefully as you get towards the end of the feeding cycle, you'll see more of it. And that's what I noticed last year. Um, those late hatch caterpillars, um, you know, the other, the early hatch ones were already pupating and, and laying their eggs and there's still some caterpillars out there trying to feed. Well, those are the ones that the fungus and the virus caught up to last year. So what you really want is those fungus and virus vectors to catch up to the population before most of them can lay their eggs. And that will be the factor that causes the population decline. Unfortunately, the weather is very important uh, to all of this. So I, I took a couple of timelines here. Here's some 14 day forecast from um, the weather network going back to May 27th and right through to June 21st. Well, it looks like a lot of sunshine, a lot of heat and not a lot of rain. So that, that looks like a perfect forecast if you're a caterpillar that intends to eat as much foliage as you can and pupate and lay eggs. It's not a great forecast if you're a fungal swore and you would like to uh, impact caterpillar populations. Of course, this accumulates then into a drought situation. Here's a, a kind of an overview map of southern Ontario um, from a couple of weeks ago. You were into moderately dry, we're into severe drought, we're into abnormally dry. But as of yesterday, I took this off of the MNR Low Water Response website. There's a stage level one uh, uh, drought declaration in all of these yellow colored zones across southern Ontario. So our trees are going to be stressed whether or not they're being defoliated by caterpillars just because there has been no moisture. We have missed every single rainstorm here in Maberly. We watch it go north, we watch it go south. Um, we have not had rain since oh, one day and I think it rained for two hours, that was it. And before that, there was snow in May and that's it. We have had no moisture. So back to my, my integrated pest management thing, if you can keep your trees healthy Generally, they might be able to withstand the impact of uh, insults like gypsy moth or other diseases, insects. But when they're stressed because of drought, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen. So a couple of examples from last year, just to give you some hope. Here's my basswood at the end of June, completely defoliated. By mid-July, that basswood had completely refoliated last year. Uh, it was almost like it shook it off like a bad COVID haircut. It just kept on going and I saw no signs of long-term stress in my basswood. Sugar maple, they, uh, sugar maple is not high on the list of things that uh, gypsy moth will eat, but if the sugar maple is between trees that it would like to eat, like oaks or elms or whatever, the uh, I did have some of my maples get completely stripped off. So here it is at the end of June on the left. Here it is mid-July. It just sat there for a long time and it really didn't want to refoliate. It was thinking about it. Should I use up my starch reserves? Yes or no. 
So the leaves that the sugar maple put out were not normal size leaves, they were quarter size leaves. Um, uh, they refoliated and this tree this year looks okay, but it's kind of slightly off color. So I can tell there's long-term stress there. Got a couple of rock elms in, in the back of my house, completely defoliated uh, by early July and uh, end August, well, completely refoliated to the point where I guess we could hang our laundry out again because we weren't gonna have all the frost coming down from the sky. But bigger concern I mentioned earlier is, is white pine. So here's an example of a white pine that got completely defoliated last year. Well, not completely. If you look at the crown, you can kind of see some green of the uh, new shoots from last year. But if you look up that kind of tree, there's very little foliage left. And back to my earlier point, the amount of wasted needles and the uh, laying on the ground underneath these pine trees is phenomenal. If the caterpillars could only be more efficient at their feeding, maybe they wouldn't cause so much destruction in the conifers. But two years of a defoliation in a row on this kind of tree and that tree will die. So longer term, what's, what's gonna happen to some of the trees? Um, you really do have to follow things over years. Um, Here's an example of a red oak, one meter in diameter. I'm guessing it's 150, 170 years old. Um, that's a long lived tree. I watched this tree, it got defoliated three years in a row by forest tank caterpillar from 2016 to 2019, followed by light defoliation of gypsy moth in 2019 and complete defoliation in 2020. And it's dead. It's got one live branch here, as you can see. That's uh, a pretty sad, quick end to a tree that's had a long life. Similarly, for sugar maple, same story, three years of forest tank caterpillar defoliation, it struggled, uh, it, it died. So back to Craig's point, the holistic ecosystem view is, you know, some trees will die, but the forest will continue on. And, you know, at, at a large scale, I guess that's okay. But when this is your, red oak tree or your sugar maple and you only have so many of them, uh, that's a completely different story. So forecast for 2022, we're almost at the end here, folks. Um, and this is just my view. Uh, we, the, the story has not been written yet. We could get three or five days of rain and, and the virus and the uh, fungus will kick in. Um, the forecast doesn't look like that, but the forecast has been wrong before. So uh, we can expect more defoliation next year. So you got to start the cycle over again. You got to look for the abundance of egg masses. You got to look for egg mass size. Uh, you have to do your egg mass count and then you have to plan accordingly. Um, you know, especially uh, when you're making financial decisions, I think Susan mentioned, um, you know, larger acreages in the tens of thousands of dollars. Well, you don't want to make that investment decision if in fact, uh, the population's on the decline or, um, you know, you may not need it. Whether Zimmer Air is going to be available to do this again next year, uh, I, I don't know. We know. I haven't spoken to them. But as Craig mentioned, they're the only game in town, so let's hope so. Um, if you are doing your egg mass count, um, you, can, you can do the count if you want. But really the important message here is five to eight egg masses per tree can result in the 40% plus defoliation, which is at the point where the tree would need to refoliate. So this is where MNR will do their egg mass survey after they do their defoliation survey and give us their prediction for next year as well. So final thoughts on the longer term, uh, think about your time scale in the forest time scale. Um, if these trees can live for 150 years, um, and we own the woodlot for 10 or 20 years, you know, we're only there for part of it. So we have to do whatever we can to keep those trees and those forests healthy. But pay attention to other invasive species. These pictures along the left bar, we've got the emerald ash borer, we've got the Asian longhorn beetle, we've got mountain pine beetle. There's a picture of a male gypsy moth, oak wilt, spotted lanternfly, forest tank caterpillar. There are any number of bugs, any number of diseases, any number of other things that are lined up to have an impact on our forest. So pay attention. If you don't know what is something is, um, use those diagnostic tools like I talked about, EdMaps or iNaturalist or ask somebody. 
So on the final note here, I, I want you to all think about the good things about Gypsy Moth. And I have to put, sorry, I know there, but really they are amazing creatures. Um, I, I've been watching these things now for two years and you know, when they're first hatched, they're only about three millimeters long. They survive the whole winter without any kind of guidance. This is all driven by instinct. Once they start to move, they immediately head up to the top of the crowns of 20 meter tall trees. So that's over 6,000 times their own length. And it, you know, it'd be like me climbing straight up 12,000 meters. And I don't, I don't like heights, so that wouldn't happen, but it's amazing, you know, and they'll do this up and down, up and down, you know, uh, many times. And um, that's what they do. The females, um, although, you know, they die after they lay their eggs, they seem to know just how to provide for their offspring. They, they, they lay their eggs on the right trees, trees that, you know, the, uh, the caterpillars when they're hatched just have to crawl up and start eating. Uh, the eggs are usually in a dry and sheltered place, so they're not going to get soaking wet or frozen. And then these little bugs can disperse very efficiently. Uh, the, the big cloud of early hatch uh, first instar larvae blowing you know, 10 kilometers away, you know, like it's amazing, their dispersal mechanisms. So they are amazing creatures. But I think uh, to kind of finish it off about us, you know, there's a lot of people on the call here tonight. This defoliation has brought a lot of people together. Uh, we now have a shared common experience. Um, I think this defoliation has us all thinking about the health of our trees in our forest. And this may have been something that we took for granted before. So pay attention, you know, look at what's going on. And if you don't know what's going on, ask questions, because if you find the first instance of an invasive species and you ask the right people, well, the options for containment are a lot better when it's a small infestation than if it's kind of chewed away for three or five years before someone discovers it. And um, at that point, it becomes a bigger problem. And then my final point is, uh, we need to take the rest of the summer to relax. I think all of us need to recover from this gypsy moth thing. So after they finish their feeding cycle, uh, your next steps really are wait until the fall um, when you can start seeing egg masses in the higher crowns and everything. And then you can start planning for 2022 at that time. So I'll sign it off at this point, but I just wanted to thank uh, the Invasive Species Center partially sponsored this and the uh, we couldn't do this without the information provided by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the Forest Health Monitoring Program. My good friend Taylor Scart, uh, Canadian Forest Service in Sault Ste. Marie is a wealth of knowledge on all things um, related to bugs and pests in the forest. I think uh, Craig and Susan mentioned um, Zimmer Air Services, but they not only do they provide an operational service, but they also help to um, bring the gypsy moth story and reality to a lot of people. And I couldn't have done this presentation without Google. So I think you all understand that. Useful references are the Ontario government uh, webpage and the invasive species webpage. So John, I'm gonna turn it back to you now. Oh, thanks Eric, it's a great presentation and we're getting a lot of comments of appreciation. Just wanna acknowledge that out there. And, and thanks to Susan and Craig too for, for their uh, contributions it's very very comprehensive and uh, lots of great information just give you a break for a couple minutes eric and uh we'll start the questions and uh i just want to do one one quick poll the final poll well one of the final polls i think just i want to see uh, we want to see if uh if folks uh kind of approach to, to doing some control in 2022 is uh is changed based on what they've seen and learned here and uh, if they're gonna try different approaches. So I'm just gonna launch that poll. It's kind of the same as the other two on your methods this year. Just maybe uh, let us know what, uh, what you're gonna try or try again. I think the way I'll do this, Eric, uh, I don't know if we really planned it, but if you're okay with it, I can read the questions that have been collected and and uh, and kind of asked all through the, the presentation to you, and then you you can just answer them to sure. the best ability or 
refer them to others. That'd be great. Yeah, getting and I'll, I'll make a, uh, I think we can make a collective commitment too. If we don't have the answers tonight, I mean, I, I'd like to remind everybody I'm not a gypsum moth expert here. <laughs> so we might not have all the answers, but we'll do our best. Yeah, and we'll, we'll follow up on that too. There's, there's lots we can do. I'm just gonna share the results there. Looks like uh, lots of people are gonna scrape and destroy egg masses before the hatch begins. Yeah, it's a little different, lots, lots still squishing and uh, small scale spraying. And uh, I don't know if that's about the same with the, the aerial spray company, the contract, but get a bit of an idea. No, I think it's more, I think a lot of people are thinking that aerial spray at, especially at anything above an acre might be effective. Yeah, right on. Excellent. Thanks to everyone for, for participating in the poll there. I'll stop sharing the results. And what I'm going to do then is uh, I'll start with the Q&A. And there's lots in the chat too, but I'll start with the Q&A right from the beginning. And uh, some of these I think you've answered in the presentation as it progressed. So we'll just, you know, we'll do what we have to do with some of them. But uh, here's here's the first question I'm going to read to you. What is the prognosis for 2022 in Eastern Ontario? I think it could be another year like this year if we don't see any of the fungus and virus show up. So um, I think I saw a lot of expansion of the uh, zone of influence uh, uh, farther east into Carleton Place and into Ottawa, farther south into Charleston Lake area, Brockville, Thousand Islands, um, lots in Trenton. So the original core area is now much broader and uh, there's a lot of defoliation. So I think 2022 is shaping up to be a lot like 2020 and 2021. Okay. There's another. But, uh, that that will, you know, we need we need to do the egg mass surveys um, to really make that prediction. So we'll have a better handle on that maybe later in the summer, fall. I would think by you know um, uh, October. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a comment, agree on the satisfaction of burning the eggs. There you go. Um, <laughs> here's a, a kind of a question. Can we get away from suggesting items such as tuck tape as birds and other species can get stuck, injured, or killed? Uh, good point. Uh, I was carefully tracking that. Um, I didn't find anything getting stuck to my tuck tape. It lost its stickiness within about two days and I took it down. So the tangle foot, uh, I didn't have any experience with that myself. I'm not sure if anybody else does. Yeah. I think there was one uh, one thing online that showed a bird that had been been stuck in, in something like that. But uh, yeah, and there's a, there's a second question about the same thing, where it's getting inadvertently stuck. Okay, uh, from Ian Fight. Oh, hi Ian. Uh, please, please, please don't use tape. Smaller animals can get stuck in the tape and inadvertently be killed. Okay, burlap is a much better option, safer. All right, thanks Ian. I am from Desert Lake. We sprayed with a helicopter in the 80s simply by, oh boy, things, uh, things move on me here because people are asking more questions. Uh, simply by advising the residents and got to it. Today, if a township or municipality wants to spray, do, do they get everyone to buy in or can they simply advise the residents of days they will be spraying? I believe Toronto and Hamilton had large spray programs in 18 and 19 and simply advise residents. Yeah, I think that that's back to the logistical challenge. So first of all, uh, in the States, there's a lot of state sponsored programs where uh, there's, there's an opt in opt out feature, but the state is the one that's doing the spraying and organizing it, um, not individuals contracting with a private contractor, but that, that type of option doesn't exist here in Ontario right now. Um, so I, I'm not sure if a municipality be willing to take on that role or a county, but just listening to the lessons from Susan and Craig, it's operationally challenging. And just as much as some people really, really want to get sprayed, there's other people that are deadly against it. And that creates 
a, a whole social dynamic that makes it even more challenging. So, but uh, ask your county, ask your municipality, ask the province. Yeah. But what naturally preys on the various gypsy moth stages? Is there anything out there that does that? I mentioned um, the uh, number of bird species. Um, uh, the black bill cuckoo, yellow bill cuckoo seem to be specialized on feeding on hairy caterpillars. I've been watching birds in the canopies of my trees. I think I'm seeing vireos uh, going after them, especially in the smaller uh stages uh blue jays i've seen red squirrels going absolutely nuts in my balsam firs uh, running back and forth to the tips of the branches and i'm suspecting they might be trying to eat them and of course if their caterpillars are crawling on the ground things like uh mice and um, other small rodents um, will prey upon them yeah. uh, but it again it's it's hard, it's not enough to really put a damper on the overall population mm. There's a comment here, robins around my house seem to love them. I don't know about that, but observation by someone. John. Yes. If I might say something about municipalities, mm -hmm. there's a municipality in uh, the Niagara area called Pelham, and they sprayed last year and this year. Uh, last year, they started it at the last minute, and then they told everybody it was happening, and they added... I think it was over $300 to everybody's tax bill for the spraying. And there was a lot of controversy. But then this year, uh, they're doing it, they did it again in May. So people might want to look at that municipality. Thanks. Susan. P E L H A M. Column. Okay. Thanks, Susan. That's great. Uh, okay, I have a number of sizes of caterpillars from likely the second stage to the fourth stage. Can we assume that they do hatch at a variable rate? Yes, you can assume that. And uh, it's one of the amazing things about the caterpillar to me is that uh, early hatchers are taking a risk. Um, they, they might be a risk of frost, the, the, you know, the leaves themselves might get damaged and destroyed and then those caterpillars would uh, not survive. Therefore, leaving the fate of the population to the late hatchers to then cycle in when the, the, the leaves refoliate. But as I mentioned early, when, when everything's great, the early hatchers are the ones that survive and the late hatchers are the ones that uh, the fungus and the virus catches up to. But it's, it's a population level strategy. I don't know how they do it. So um, there's caterpillars. I don't know where the late hatchers are coming from. I thought, you know, they'd all be gone. But remember that map I showed you was the 90% hatch rate. Well, there's still 10% of them out there waiting to be hatched somewhere. They could have been laid in a, in a uh, cavity in a tree and, and it didn't warm up as quickly, that kind of thing. So, right. um, yep, you, you will find all stages sometimes condensed in the same area. But the, the larger ones are the ones that are feeding heavily. Right. Okay. How does spraying affect other flying insects? I sure love my butterflies. So that's back to what you're spraying with. The broad spectrum of pesticides will kill a broad spectrum of insects and they're not recommended, especially if there's bees around. The BTK is very specific to Lepidopteran species, which are the ones that cause, uh, uh, sorry, uh, become butterflies and moths. And uh, interestingly, in that um, the forest tank caterpillar and the gypsy moth being somewhat at the beginning of the season, their life cycles don't intersect with the life cycle of other Lepidopteran species. So, you know, things like monarchs and whatnot. So, um, that's why it's important to spray at the early life stages of those two caterpillars that you're targeting so you don't inadvertently affect more beneficial Lepidopteran species. Right on. And uh, does gypsy moth eat red pine? Yep. Yeah. I, I don't think it feeds heavily on it, but I've certainly seen it in red pine. Yeah. And the, uh, here's a question for everybody. I, I don't know the answer to this one. I've seen egg masses on white cedar 
but I have not observed feeding on white cedar. So if someone's got an experience with that, just throw it into the chat. Mm. How long does it take until the gypsy? They don't like eating junipers. Oh. I'm sorry, what was that, Eric? Uh, of the conifers, the ones that they really don't feed upon are junipers. Junipers, okay. Like uh, ground juniper and red cedar. Yeah. How long does it take until the gypsy moth population naturally implodes and crashes? Ah, good question. Um, I think it's it's really dependent on the environmental factors. So, um, I like there's no cycle for gypsy moth. We don't have enough history, but uh, a two or three or four year outbreak is not uncommon uh, throughout the northeastern United States. Mm -hmm. We got a couple of comments, people saying that their white cedar is indeed being fed on by, by gypsy moth, but it doesn't seem like it's heavy yeah, feeding. Good to know. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Questions are are moving again because people are making the comments. Sorry, I'll just uh, scroll to where I was. Okay. Is it too late to use BTK? Will it work now that they have already begun feeding? I would say it's too late to use BTK. They're in their fourth, fifth instars. At this point, uh, the dose of BTK that you'd have to put on is quite high and wouldn't cause the same uh, digestive disruption. At this point, they're just eating machines. Uh, might slow them down a bit, but it wouldn't kill them. I, it's best done in the first, second, and third instars. So Eric, if I might add, we are seeing some of the earlier instars now, still. Um, and, and our hope is that the BT that was sprayed over the last few days will affect those. And, and again, uh, give enough protection to the foliage that, that uh, the trees will survive. So we are seeing the smaller, uh, um, uh, in star stages now, along with the gigantic uh, uh, caterpillars as well. <laughs> Does spraying with dilute soap solution work? Um, I've seen it recommended. I have not tried it myself. Um, I don't know what the dilution rate would need to be. Um, but I, I've heard people that have been trying soap mixed with some vegetable oil, you know, so that it's a, a stick, hit and stick kind of um, spray. So I, I'm not sure if there's people with experience on that, uh, please jump in. What defines a homeowner with respect to pesticide use? Can anyone use if, if they employ an arborist for application? Yeah, if you're if you're hiring someone who is a licensed applicator, they have access to a much broader array of product. Homeowner is basically the stuff that you can buy at Canadian Tire Home Hardware Garden Centers, that, that type of thing. So it's usually in smaller quantities. It's already at a diluted level. Um, it's uh, relatively safe to use, uh, relatively targeted. So. Um, yeah, look up, look, look on the MOE website for uh, cosmetic pesticides and you'll find what kind of products are available, but it's, it's pretty limited. I think you'll, you'll know uh, when you go to buy, you know, herbicides like Roundup, it's, it's in very dilute, small containers. It's not the big totes that a farmer might be able to get hold of. Mm -hmm. Just uh, want to address a whole bunch of questions. People asking if this is available as a recording. It will be, and we'll we'll have the links posted on the OWA and, and Eastern Ontario Model Force websites, and we'll send them out to everybody within a day or so. So that's good. Uh, just a comment. We've seen uh, John. Yes. Sorry, just uh, I wanted to address one point on this life cycle slide that we didn't really talk about. And if you look in the yellow. Uh, dialogue box it says uh, July August different methods to trap male and female moss there are traps pheromone traps that um, can be uh, acquired but 
really it's not registered as a control product. It's really for monitoring purposes. So the, the traps contain a pheromone and the males are attracted to it. So you can gather up tons of males um, and you think you're, you're doing something. But back to my point, one male uh, can service a lot of females and, um, you know, is it having a population level impact? But so people are using them, but I'm not sure it's within the uh, specified label use of the product. Um, nevertheless, it's, um, I think people are finding them. I don't, I, I wouldn't know where to get them. My only caution on that is don't get any of that pheromone scent on you because then you become the thing that the male moths are attracted to and you'll regret that for many years to come. So just a comment here, bluebirds eating are eating the caterpillars. Someone's seen that. Um, just a thank you to Eric from Myola Price. This has been a wake up for a lot of urbanites who now are taking trees and defoliators a lot more seriously. Community people are talking to each other, something new. I think we kind of touched on that for sure in the slide deck too. Uh, can watering- I think Iola had a good story. Sorry, Iola sent me a note about um, communities in Ottawa really getting together. And it, it really seems to be kind of in that COVID theme. Everybody was baking or making hobby scale maple syrup, but everybody's out there together on common cause when it comes to trees. So I, there's some good that comes out of this. I put that in my last slide that, you know, bringing people together and having them pay attention to how trees work um, is not a bad thing from my perspective. Absolutely. Just a question here, can watering my few maple trees help? Absolutely. Uh, I would suggest uh, on that slide I showed you that we're in drought condition, uh, you really need to water your trees to give them the best chance at repoliation without stress. Uh, some people are asking me whether you should fertilize at the same time, and I would say no. Uh, the tree doesn't need to grow a big, huge set of leaves. It just needs to get enough to sustain its growth for next year. Fertilization might artificially, you know, induce more growth, and that's not what it needs at this point. So just help it get through hot July, hot August, and hopefully um, go into the fall and and as good a condition as you can hope for. Any recommendations for small seedlings and their survival regarding gypsy moth? Seedlings of what species, John, did it say? Doesn't say, no. So um, this is one of the, the things, if, I've, in my forest, I've got like big mature trees and then lots of maple seedlings on the forest floor. So at this point, the, the caterpillars don't seem to be feeding on the naturally regenerated seedlings. So they're actually benefiting from the overstory defoliation because they're getting some sunlight. So that's a beneficial thing, but um, other species might be taking advantage of that, like European buckthorn and whatnot, and, and uh, so that's not a good thing. So it's a hard question to answer because it's really a specific question as to what seedlings you're talking about growing and what kind of forest condition. But seedlings can be fed upon just as likely as a mature tree. It's just, I don't think they start feeding from the ground up. They start from the crown down. Just uh, some folks asking about pheromone traps or the male moth lure traps. Any comments on those there? Yeah, I just addressed that about uh, two questions ago. Oh, okay. Sorry. That was my little yellow dialogue box on this life cycle we're looking at. Okay. So pheromone traps will are for monitoring purposes, not for control purposes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Great presentation, thank you. I've got egg masses on my wheelbarrow, so they're not that discerning about where they lay their eggs. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are not. Yeah. And a comment, I've used dilute soap solution and it does kill the ones on the tree. And I saw someone say they use one, 30 to one. Uh, 
what, what kind of soap? Uh, like sunlight or dawn detergent? Does it matter? Yeah, I'm not sure. They're not saying. Uh, there's lots of comments here. Truly great presentation. Does the moth prefer one species of oak over another? I, my experience, uh, I've got um, red oak, white oak, and bur oak on my property, and they're all equally fed upon with glee and abandoned by the <laughs> gypsy moth. So I would say no. Yeah, okay. And someone just said it's Dawn Soap. Yeah. That's the brand. Okay. okay. It has ammonia in it. Sorry, Susan, it has what in it? Amo a bit of ammonia in it. Oh, okay. Okay, that's good to know. And then a big question here is, is this connected to climate change? What's going on in general? I, the, the, the climate change question for me comes down to uh, the observation I made about our hot, dry springs. Uh, I find it unusual that we've had the gypsy moth outbreak and the forest tank caterpillar outbreak coincide with abnormally hot and dry springs uh, like where is the rain it seems to be passing us by and you know to be in level one drought in early june is pretty unusual so is that just weather or is that climate change um probably one in the same but i i do think there's um there's a connection there between these larger outbreaks of pests and what's happening more globally that's my own opinion. Does Crisco shortening work? Um, is someone frying them and having them for supper? What's going on? I don't know. <laughs> I guess maybe smeared on the tree or the, the, the trunk of the tree. Oh, well, I, I, I had a couple of questions about this. I. Any kind of fat like that would, uh, I think, get absorbed by the tree. And I, I don't know what kind of detrimental effect it would have on the tree. So if you're going to try it, I would make sure that you wrap the tree in wax paper or uh, plastic wrap first and apply the sticky stuff or whatever um, on the outside of that. Don't apply it directly against the bark of the tree. Okay. But if, if it works for someone, I'd be glad to hear it. Yeah. Just uh, someone is asking, why are there no gypsy moss in Gray Bruce County? Oh, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I, 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 I just think it's they'll they'll find their way there eventually. Mm. Would spraying affect the morning cloak butterfly that winters and comes out at first warmth, that overwinters and comes out at first warmth? Well, if it's a moth at that stage, I would say no. It, like the spraying has to be ingested by the caterpillar feeding on foliage. So I'm not familiar with the, the butterfly they're talking about. Um, is it a lepidopter? I'm not sure. That's, yeah, it's, that's a, it's a my... morning cloak. It's a, it's a lepidopter and yeah. Okay, well, we'd have to look at the life cycle of it and then line it up against the life cycle of the gypsy moth and make the comparison. And someone just asking if vinegar and hydrogen peroxide might kill the eggs mixture. I'll leave that up to the crowd to answer. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't heard of that one. And there's a one that's kind of been repeated a few times. Why, why is where is the provincial government taking action on this, and why were property owners not notified last year, so the preventative measures could have been taken? Well, I I, I wouldn't say they're not active. Um, again, the the monitoring, the health monitoring that goes on. So the maps that I showed you about, you know, the what has happened and what's likely to happen comes from the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, there was tons of information put out last year warning people of the potential impact of this year. So um, 
it maybe didn't hit your radar screen, but um, last year it was kind of a growth industry for every group, including ours, uh, to put fact sheets out to try to get the message out to people. So sometimes it, it doesn't really resonate until these bugs are right in your face and then you wonder where they came from. Right. <laughs> but if, if you have questions like that, um, you know, please direct them right to the ministry. I'm just switching over to the chat now and uh, just uh, a few comments and questions. Uh, just someone saying we can send some to great groups. We have lots. Yeah. <laughs> Very helpful presentation. Thanks. Uh, has anyone tried lime sulfur spray? I haven't heard that one before. I have not. Just a comment here. I tried Crisco shortening and smeared on the tree trunks and it's keeping them from climbing above it, allowing me to squish them several times a day. Best post egg, ma egg mass method I've tried. Well, that's interesting. A lot of anecdotal stuff here. Dawn dish soap works great. My tree mounted birdhouses were very popular spots for the egg masses. I imagine. And, and for the pupa, uh, too. Yeah. John, I was going to mention that uh, because there's been questions about using just different things. I'm experimenting actually with putting duct tape around the tree with the, with the shiny side out and then spraying on that band permethrin, uh, the ortho max home defense. This permethrin is a contact insecticide and it's persistent as long as you, know, you don't have torrential downpours. And I, I don't know if the gypsy moth are cooperating with us or what, but we found it actually to be particularly effective for a day or two. Very interesting. Just a lot of comments that, uh, again, the cedars are being fed on, but not voraciously. It does have some effect, but not, not any severe defoliation from the general comments here. Uh, Very informative presentation, thank you. Yeah, you have mentioned when a tree is defoliated and it needs to regrow, the leaves it uses up starch reserves. We have some sugar maples that were attacked last year and we'll eat this year. These are also trees that we do little maple syrup tapping in the, a little maple syrup tapping in the spring. Are we stressing these too much? Should we hold off on tapping them for a year or two? Uh, yeah, so the maple syrup producers had that same question. I, I, I've been working, I'm a syrup producer myself, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when the forest tank caterpillar came to town, many of uh, the producers decided that they needed to spray their sugar maple trees because of that concern over starch depletion. But you have uh, other mitigation things. I, I wouldn't suggest you not tap, but if uh, your tree is of a sufficient diameter that you had two taps in last year, you could go back to one tap. Uh, you could tap every other tree. Like, you know, just make sure that the trees are as healthy as they can be and put less stress on them. But to cease operations when you're a maple producer, is not really an option. Maybe at a hobby scale, you can lay off for a year or two um, and let the trees heal up. But, you know, generally speaking, um, gypsy moth do not prefer to eat sugar maple. Um, they may feed on sugar maple, as I mentioned, if it's in the path between two species of trees that they like to eat. Um, so, you know, if, if you notice that the tree did suffer defoliation, maybe you let off on that one because other trees probably did not need to refoliate and use up starch resources. But keep the crowns healthy. Do your selective thinning. Do your sugar bush management. Um, make sure you've got good growth going into these calamities and they should come out the other side okay. Okay. There's a question, if anyone is affected by a rash, does anyone know of any doctor that knows how to treat this situation? I'll just throw that out there. Um, and a number of people, everyone's different with these sorts of reactions and some really react severely as we've seen. So uh, lots of good comments on the presentation, extend appreciation to Eric, Susan and Craig, well prepared and presented. 
Lots and lots of those. Uh, question, can you tell which pupae are male or female? I, I cannot, I, I cannot. Yeah. I, I don't Agreed. know if there's an entomologist in the crowd listening in that uh, can give us some advice there. <laughs> With an accumulation of <clears throat> dead gypsy moth caterpillars in the lakes along with the shoreline, has anyone had complaints of swimmers ish that may just be a result of the caterpillars? I did have a report from Bennett Lake where I'm located and uh, someone thought they were getting swimmers itch, but then they said, hang on a second, I haven't been swimming. Um, so it was likely just the uh, gypsy moth hairs on land, but Sure enough, I mean, those hairs will, will blow anywhere. Um, and if you're swimming, you might come into contact with them as well. So generally speaking, if you're uh, sensitive to things like uh, poison ivy or uh, poison parsnip, uh, some people are a lot more sensitive uh, than you would likely be sensitive to this irritation as well, regardless of where you came into contact with. Here's a, a comment and a question. We spray with permethrin commercially for carpenter ants. If we include bases of trees, would that prevent them climbing trees? I can maybe address that, John, because we also spray our home for carpenter ants. And, and it does, does appear that it has kept the uh, caterpillars largely off our home. Uh, but in speaking with the uh, pest applicator, uh, it's not, a, uh, I understand it's not licensed for that application, or he wasn't. Um, but then we were using the OrthoMax, the, uh, and again, we had some luck with that. But I don't think, a uh, actually, uh, Eric's a licensed applicator. Um, I don't think you can uh, commercially spray with the, with the concentration they use for car uh, carpenter, can you? I, I, I don't know. Um, my approach to any kind of pesticide is to find the label first and read it. And if back to my point in the slide, uh, the label will tell you what it's licensed to, to control, how to mix it properly, what safety measures to take. So, I mean, it might be effective at things that aren't listed, um, but then you're technically not using the product legally. So if that's the case and it works well, don't go telling everybody about it. <laughs> Can you use landscape fabric instead of burlap on the trees? I, I would say yes. I, I would say that any kind of uh, shady shelter thing uh, would be equally as effective. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't use plastic bags, but any kind of breathable fabric like a uh, sheets or towels or burlap or landscape fabric. Yep. Yeah. What effect does rain have after spraying? Well, uh, it depends on how soon the rain happens. So um, it the the caterpillars. First of all, the spray has to find its way onto the surface of the leaf. Secondly, then the caterpillars have to feed upon that leaf and, and feed and get enough of it in their system to be effective. So if the rain happens too quickly after uh, the spraying, it could negate the spray itself. Likewise, ultraviolet uh, radiation uh, will slowly degrade the product on the leaf. So that's why there's always a suggested double application for, for the BTK. Right so, uh, I think most applicators will not spray if it looks like rain. Craig, uh, you had that experience in Burgesswood, didn't you? Yeah, exactly. So on, on whether they, it's a pilot's decision as to whether they spray or not. Um, and it's the humidity, the temperature, the wind speed, and proximity of uh, precipitation. The actual uh, spray they say is effective, it's 4A that they use. And it's one to four days. Uh, I mean, you read different literature and it goes up and down a little bit, but ostensibly it's about one to four days that it's uh, effective. And I know on our own property, 
we saw the biggest effect within about two days of the spray and then it, it tapered off. But in part, that was because we were also dealing with some uh, later instars than, than would be best. But they, they watched it pretty carefully. Uh, there were some days that we were pretty anxious thinking you can fly, you can fly, you can fly and, and uh, no helicopters. So they, they watch it pretty carefully. A question from a, an old friend of mine from Alberta, Keith McLean. I think he's here in Ontario now too. So is there any stand management action that can be taken to slow the spread? Removing susceptible lodgepole pine stands based on age size is being advocated for slowing the spread of mountain pine beetle in the West. I, there, I, I picked up, there are a couple of publications out of the uh, states, uh, Kentucky, uh, sorry, not Kentucky, Virginia, and uh, somewhere else uh, that have like, th that are stand management recommendations for how to make your stand more resilient against gypsy moth. So John, maybe if you get Keith's email, I can connect that way. Yeah, for sure. Be good to reconnect with Keith. And here's a comment. I Oh, it's from Iola Price. Uh, I sprayed some egg masses with PAM, canola and lecithin, which is their main components. And that seemed to work, smothered the eggs, I think. That's interesting. Be similar to dormant oil then, I guess. Mm. One thing I didn't follow up on, um, as should have, when I was uh, back to my uh, sugar bush management story, uh, at the end of the season, we, we wash out all the pipelines, we backwash them with water, and then uh, to put them away for the season, we uh, uh, use some isopropyl alcohol and squirt it in the line as a disinfectant, and that's organically certified. But you have this little backpack of, uh, of isopropyl alcohol. So as I saw egg masses, I was giving them a squirt of that stuff, and um, I meant to follow up to see if any of them hatched out. I just didn't have time. So I'm, uh, I'm kind of skipping over a lot of repetitive questions that we've already talked to. There's, there's a few more. Um, I think we're kind of getting to the end here. There's a few more new ones. Is there a way to use scent to attract them to the desk? If they like love oak, oak essential oil, for example, is a scent that might attract them to a lovely dish of soapy water or something. That's an interesting concept. Uh, I have not heard of that. The only scent stuff is the pheromone of using the, the the scent that the female puts out to attract the male yeah. but at, at a caterpillar level i i'm not sure that's a that's a good concept of it i don't know the answer to that yeah yeah something that you can kind of look into i'll sum all this up though but uh, just a, another good comment here purple loose strife was a big problem but they figured out some way to control it not sure but introducing a natural predator or something Will the moss have natural predators we can get to go after them? Something we can introduce, I think. Yes. Yes. And so that is the fungus, the Entomophaga myomiga, and the MPV. Those are the only two natural control factors that will have an impact on the population. Everything else we do is about protecting individual trees or groups of trees, but it's not causing the population of gypsy moth to decline. Yeah. So uh, gypsy moth is like the purple loose drive story in that there is some of the control vectors that are now available to keep the population at bay. So compare that to something like emerald ash borer where there's absolutely nothing uh, at scale that will control that insect right now. I mean, they're testing some parasitic wasps and whatnot, but um, certainly not enough of them to slow the spread of emerald ash borer. Yeah. So that is the long-term solution for a lot of this stuff is to find the natural checks and balances for the species as opposed to spraying pesticides or, you know, taking small, you know, intervening that kind of way. Yeah. Just uh, scrolling through some here. Here's something interesting. Emerging data in New York is demonstrating that the white-footed mouse controls populations, but not infestations. 
in the Hudson Valley of New York five and six years ago, we had large crops of first red oak mast, followed the next year by a large white oak mast crop. Subsequently, the mouse population exploded and crashed the following winter. The result was significant infestations the following three years before the population died off. Okay. I think we're just about done here. I, I'm, I'm skipping over some questions that have really been answered already. And uh, again, lots of appreciation for the great presentation and speakers. Yeah, that's really it. And uh, I'll just encourage folks, just send me more questions if you need to, and I'll I'll get someone to help me summarize them and we'll, we'll try our best to get answers and uh, include those in some sort of summary later on. There is a, a survey again that Jim mentioned going out after this that we'll send and uh, trying to think what else. Um, yeah, we'll get the recording, the links to the recording uh, posted on the websites pretty quickly. And we'll also probably just email them to everybody same time, probably with the survey. One thing we'll do with uh, folks that aren't members of the OWA is uh, we'll offer everybody uh, a free uh, copy of the last issue of the Woodlander on uh, Forage in the Forest and Edible Wilds. And uh, just as a thank you for participating and uh, you should see all that coming out shortly. I don't know uh, Eric or Susan or Craig or Jim, any, any final thoughts or messages? Hey, Jared, hey, Eric. Sorry, just uh, just picking up on that last point, John. Um, like being a member of an association is pays dividends in, in times like this. You get good information exchange. Um, I think tonight was valuable because people are sharing their own experiences and observations. Sometimes science is only part of it. It's um, a lot of people and a lot of people talking to each other. So I encourage people to join model forest or woodlot association or whatever group you think is aligned with you because it's how we're going to get through some of these challenges together. Good. Thank you, Eric. That's a good point. I, uh, with the, the merger of the Eastern Ontario model forest with the Ontario woodlot association, it's, uh, it's going to be one membership very shortly anyway, but, uh, yeah, we'd encourage you to join. We can bring more, more sessions like this to you and, and, and more really good information and that, mentorship and sharing within uh, based on our own experiences and knowledge is, is just so powerful. I think also when you belong as we do to a community association or a group of people where you can communicate with them quite easily, that made a huge difference to us. And I know there's other like lake associations and other community associations um that can organize as well and that really helps i don't know how we could have done it otherwise well that's great that you were able to get that to happen uh, susan craig it's amazing not an easy thing but it's worth it yeah jim should i give you the last word if you want to unmute yourself and you're the chair of the forest health network and uh really so much of this is your good work and Bringing everyone together. Well, I'd like to thank uh, members of the Forest Health Network getting everyone together. Like we had over 500 people joining us tonight. I want to thank Eric. I want to thank Susan. I want to thank uh, Craig for the time they put in putting this presentation together. And John, I want to thank you for everything that you've done as far as the moderator concerned. It ran very, very smoothly. And just keep in mind, uh, we're going to have another session. I uh, have to work it out with Eric, whether it's September, or what have you. Uh, what happened to us in 2021 and where do we expect to go for 2022? So stay tuned. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll publicize that far and wide too. So um, yeah, that's great. Well, with that, well, thank everybody, and, and we appreciate your kudos and, and very positive comments and your engagement out there. Um, of course, this, this sort of uh, online 
uh, webinar isn't ideal. People like face-to-face -face more, most of us, but boy, it works out pretty well when you think about it. It, uh, it sure uh, gave us a chance to reach a lot of people and, and I think share some great information. So with that, we'll say good night and say thanks to everyone for participating. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. You did a great job. I agree. Good night. I'm going to stop recording now, too. Ha, 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 ha.